to be exchanged kind of grow and become more sort of data driven, um, this becomes a more significant problem. So today we're really going to look at this issue. We're going to look at how um, we can share information between services and how we can use this, this Confluent platform um, uh, and, and the sort of tools within it to, to look at this problem of moving data between services and getting them to sort of uh, marry together um, using a slightly different light. I guess specifically a sort of stream processing light. So microservices is really about splitting the roles within a system into discrete units. So here, for example, we've got like a UI service, we've got an order service, we've got a fulfillment service. And each of those services kind of maps to some underlying um, sort of uh, business function. And but the, the kind of key, for me at least, to, the, to the microservices approach is allowing these services to evolve independently of one another. Um, so it's really this independence, the fact that service is able to, to be independent and evolve independently, that is, that is really the key to why we want to use services. Microservices actually provide a bunch of other useful properties, right? So we also have, um, we can get good encapsulation, we can get good, good reuse, we can actually get pretty good, good scalability. They're not actually necessarily the sort of core tenet for why we would choose this architecture. Um, for me, it really ends up being this independence, which is which is so important. That each service is able to evolve its life cycle on its own. So to understand this a little bit better, we need to look at a monolithic application. A well-managed monolith actually can provide um, many of those other tenants, like for use and encapsulation. And even to a certain extent, so some degree of scalability. But where it gets tricky is when we actually try and scale the monolith out, when we basically add more kind of engineers as we get bigger. Um, because when we grow, it becomes increasingly difficult for the contributions of more and more engineers to, to, be, uh, to be integrated. And that means that it becomes increasingly difficult for us to provide agility to the business users, which we, which we effectively serve. So by splitting systems into business services, we regain some of that agility. By taking this microservices approach, we, we um, regain some of that agility, um, albeit at the expense, to some extent, of some additional complexity. So basically, splitting these services, uh, splitting our monolith into a set of services, really just allows us to operate um, in, in a more kind of natural way, in a slightly more agile way. Our interesting thing is that companies, um, if we step sort of back a bit, um, also kind of look a bit like this. So co companies are inevitably formed of a collection of independent systems, which almost work together for some, to some degree. Um, but the problem with companies is that their architecture is rarely done by, rarely done by design. The architecture tends to evolve really in the shape of the business that created it. So that's, that's really how we would flow into what's known as Conway's Law. So uh, another kind of popular approach to this is, is, the, is this inverse Conway maneuver. And the inverse Conway maneuver um, is really saying that rather than letting an organizational structure dictate our architecture, the architecture we like to build, we move our organization around, we move the people around so that it matches the architecture that we want. And in, in, and, and, and in this way, this allows us to, cut, to create sensible separations of concerns. We're basically able to separate our concerns into services which make sense from a technical architecture perspective, really by forming teams that, that, that match that. So one important, well, one other important property of microserver applications, um, and actually indeed of large company architectures, is that they tend to eschew uh, shared state. So, for example, you know, different teams collaborating over a shared database is well known to kind of lead to headaches. You know, shared mutable state tends to lead to tight temporal and data, uh, data couplings. So, um, service-based approaches um, also kind of suffer from this because, or well, sorry, they don't suffer from, from this because they tend to spread data across a bunch of different services. That's to say, services tend to, uh, to effectively own their own data. 
And they kind of need to do that because they need to be able to evolve on their own. Coming back to that, that need for systems to evolve um, quickly and independently in a microservices architecture, or actually any service architecture. Um, but states will inevitably be shared with services. So on this side, we sort of see each service being effectively independent, but services have to communicate with one another. And that actually means some implicit sharing of state. So we sort of don't want all our services to share one database, but we do need them to share information. And really, to do this well, it involves thinking carefully about the toolkit, the tools which we use to share data between, between data services. And that's really very much what we're going to be talking about today, how we can look at some of these uh, streaming technologies and apply them to this problem of um, sharing state between a number of services. OK, so this is me. Uh, that's me. That, I'm Ben. Uh, ben Stopford. I'm an engineer at Confluent, as Trevor said earlier. Um, we used to work at ThorWorks and a few uh, financial companies in the UK. And um, I've been working with distributed data platforms for a little over a decade now. Um, so that's kind of a bit of an introduction. Um, the next thing I wanted to really talk about was, was to really just some simple patterns. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of fun, some of the fundamentals of sewing these kind of systems together. So the first one, which is kind of a, something we have to talk about because it's the basis of a lot of, of, of a lot of these a lot of microservice approaches and actually service-oriented architectures before them is, the, is this idea of re re request response. So if we think back to SOA days, like over a decade ago now, um, the protocol that was generally used is, is SOAP. Um, these days, REST is more popular, and there's obviously a whole bunch of different um, request response protocols you can use um, to, 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 to piece services together. So, so request response is like request response is I sort of intuitively ideal for looking things up. Um, that's kind of that's kind of its uh, simplest and most useful paradigm. In fact, we can build entire architect architectures based on request response. It's a totally flexible pattern in that regard, and it's commonplace in many companies um, with a kind of long lineage. Um, but when it comes to the trade-offs. Um, there's, there's a sort of fairly significant set of trade-offs where we, when we compare request response with event-driven approaches. So event-driven approaches are a little bit different. Um, really, event-driven serv services leverage asynchronous communication channels um, and typically involve this idea of a broker. So Kafka is a broker, a broker technology, which we'll obviously be talking about today. But adding a broker insulates your service um, from all of the services that sit down downstream from it. So in an event-driven architecture, um, services raise events which themselves model the information flowing in your business. So let's say, for example, um, an event might be that a purchase has been made. And then other services, so unbeknown to the originator, react to those events, so further downstream. So for example, you might a, a downstream service might react to the fact that a purchase has been made by, let's say, making a payment or whatever it might be. So the core idea behind this, the reason that event-driven approaches tend to fit quite well with business systems is that businesses often are actually modeled as a flow or a sequence of events. So you add an item to your cart on the left-hand side. Let's use the point here, don't I? Um, so you add an, you add an item to your cart um, on the left-hand side. You then go into buy, you purchase it. Um, then there's a sort of whole slew of downstream processes we kick off. In this case, we're going to update stock. We might package the item and then dispatch it. And the point is that this kind of linear flow is actually often um, well suited to this kind of event-driven approach, an approach which uses effectively a broker to decouple the, producer, the, the producing service over here from the services that depend upon it. And the reason this is important is by adding a broker, it makes it very easy. Oops, 
it makes it very, very easy for us to add in extra services. Because this service here, when he publishes something to a, in a, an event for an architecture, or to a broker, um, or to a broker technology, rather, um, has no knowledge of who might be consuming from it. So the event-driven model is preferable um, in a few circumstances. Firstly, when microservices, um, it allows microservices to be built on a backbone of business event events. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but it's really this idea that we focus our communications around real business concepts, um, that, or event sourcing is another way of thinking about this. So this becomes very handy when we want to plug in new services, when we want to be fungible. Secondly, um, a service, each service has no real context of the services around it or the things which sit downstream, which again um, allows us to respond to real world, world, world events, etc. So from a microservice perspective, we actually here have a couple of different approaches. We can base our microservices on an event-based model using a kind of event-driven architecture. It's kind of idea over, the, over on the left-hand side where there's a message broker involved. Or we can use request response. Um, we can actually use a hybrid of, the, of, 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 of each one too. Um, and this pattern actually can work really well um, where we use the request response paradigm for things which make quite a lot of sense. So uh, particularly um, looking things up. But we use the event-based side, the message broker, really for journaling all of our state changes. So that's, bit, that's effectively event sourcing. So let's just look at, look at that in a little bit more detail, a little, little bit more detail, just with a sort of simple example. So um, here in this example, uh, my friend Bob here is buying a new iPad, um, and we're going to demonstrate this kind of request response approach. So this UI service would make a call to the order service, which in turn would make a call to the stock service. Likewise, um, when uh, to process this, this purchase, and we might also add make additional calls to fulfillment and additional calls for order detection. So it's kind of up to this service, in this case, to make a, a series of calls um, and manage the, the dependencies that sit around that. If we were to do this in an event-driven approach, we get a slightly different pattern. So it looks a little bit simpler because effectively all the UI service has to do is effectively register an event. So it's really just to say, in this case, that a purchase has happened. Um, that will then be read by any particular service that happens to be interested in, the, in that information. And it's actually, in this case, it would be the order service which would publish a response, um, which UI service would listen listen for, um, which would tell him, allow him to confirm back to our friend Bob here that um, his purchase has gone through successfully. So that's kind of the typ typical event-driven approach. So here we're mixing sort of um, what is effectively synchronous and asynchronous paradigms in one package. And then if this third, in this third approach, we might just have the UI service just call directly to the order service using, say, something like REST. And then the order service would just event source um, his changes in state to the message broker, which would then get propagated to all of our downstream services. So this kind of blends um, some of the benefits of, of both of those approaches. So as, as software engineers, um, we were never to be affected by the tools we surround ourselves with. Um, languages, frameworks, even processes act to shape the software we build. Um, so the tools that we choose, um, and the, specifically I guess the, the tool set that we choose, is, has a pretty significant effect on the way that our architectures tend to turn out. So which, which tools you actually piece together actually has a pretty big effect on the way that your architecture behaves at the end. So Kafka is well suited to this event-driven architecture approach. And if you use Kafka to build a, a, service, a sort of service backbone, it will inevitably lead you down this path. It will inevitably influence you in that way. Um, 
So that's 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 a which I would like to think is a good thing. Certainly, um, from from the perspective of, of, of a fairly large part of applications. So that was kind of an introduction. Um, now we're going to talk a bit about the tool set. Um, we're going to talk about three tools, Kafka itself, just very briefly, really. Um, we're going to talk about case streams, um, and, we're, and we'll very briefly talk about Connect. Um, I think just as, as uh, really an introduction to the important concepts that we need to take from these three. So Kafka itself is a distributed log. So what does that actually mean? Well, it's a little bit like a messaging system, if you're familiar with a messaging system. Um, it's a broker technology. You hand in a message, um, which goes into a thing called a topic, and you can subscribe, or any other service can subscribe to that topic and listen to, effectively, the broadcast of messages that come from it. But a distributed log itself is actually um, a slightly different concept because it has in, inherent to it um, some quite nice scalability, scalability and availability uh, constructs. So on the left-hand side here, we've got some producing services. And on the right-hand side here, we have some, some consuming services. And kind of one of the important points is that we're at, we actually at, we have sort of three levels. We have the level of, sort of we have producing services, Kafka itself, and consuming services. And um, there is no single bottleneck anywhere within this architecture. When we write messages, we shard them across a set of servers um, inside the uh, Kafka cluster. Um, each shard is then an individual queue, and we control where, where data uh, ends up by using a key so that we can ensure that we get good ordering guarantees. So we're effectively linear, linearly, linearly scalable within the Kafka. And then on the consumption side, Kafka has this quite neat feature which allows you to spread data across a set of consuming services. So in this case where we have four different services um, over here, we can actually spread um, a single topic across them. So basically a quarter of the, of the events will go to one and a quarter of the events will go to the other, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is the, the combination of this means that you basically have this kind of linearly scalable uh, fire, fire hose. Um, and the nice thing about this is it allows, it sort of freezes from some of the constraints that we would get with a typical message base architecture. Because we don't have to worry about scalability um, for most use cases. And uh, we actually also don't have to worry so much about data retention. Um, and we can also always reduce back to a globally ordered queue if that's something that we require. So there are a couple of things that we get out of this from a service perspective. Firstly, we get load balancing. So here we can have two services which are subscribing to a topic, um, and Kafka will naturally balance the data between those two. Also, if one of those fails, we'll get fault tolerance because the other one would just pick up uh, the messages which had been, been directed to the service that died. And this means we can build always on services because we're reliant on this this underlying fault tolerant broker. Another quite interesting feature is that we, because Kafka is more like a database in that regard, it means that we can rewind and replay. So we can go back in the log um, and read messages um, historically, which we can retain for effectively well, as, much, as long as we have storage space. Um, and this gives us some interesting features when it comes to regenerating state and services, particularly when we're event sourcing. Another thing we can do is use this thing called a compacted log. This is a little bit subtler, but it just happens to be quite important for some of the things that we're talking about later. And really, this just means that whilst typically we would have um, a log which contains maybe just, just literally a journal of all messages, those messages have a key, like maybe a key in a, uh, in a primary key in a database, and we can use a compacted log to ensure that we'll just keep the latest version. What that basically means is that the topic inside Kafka ends up looking much like a database table. So only the latest update will ever be visible, or certainly will, it will be kept. Um, so that turns out to be pretty useful when we start looking at how we can blend, we blend stream processing in Nets, which is exactly what we're going to do. So, K-Streams sits on top of Kafka. 
And case streams is basically a database engine for data in flux. Um, it's embeddable. It's much like a sort of standard Kafka client. And it turns out to be pretty useful when we start wanting to sew, sew together data-centric services. So how, what exactly is a stream processing engine? Um, well, basically, it's just, yeah, it is a database engine. It's a, it's a database engine which allows us to, to run a query continuously. Um, so, for example, here we say you know, the max price from orders uh, where the currency is GBP. So that looks much like a, an SQL query. Um, this isn't uh, actual case streams query. This is just a really more generic example. Um, but the point is that we have a query much like we would have in a database, but rather than applying it um, to some historical data, we're just going to apply it to the stream. And because we're applying it to a stream, we can have to add these extra clauses at the end that say, put it over a one-day window and emit results every seconds. So what we're going to get is we're going to get a continuously updated total um, of this particular query. So if we bit like we have a so we have a database on the left, a database query engine sits across some data and, and, and normally an index. Um, whereas in a stream processor, we have a query engine which takes uh, and inputs of, of streams. And those, these streams are chopped up into things called windows, and we need windows because um, they allow us to reason about an infinite data stream. So this kind of windowing concept is actually pretty complex. It is pretty complex um, in, in, in application, but conceptually very simple, fairly simple. We just need to be able to, to bound the amount of data that we're going to consider particularly, or actually almost exclusively, when we're doing joins. So the features of case streams are very similar to a database. We can, uh, we can join different streams together. Um, we can take that, those joins messages, and we can cast them into our own view. So we can basically take some source messages and port them into our own domain model. Um, we can then apply filters, sort of predicates, where clauses, et cetera, onto that, onto uh, that stream of events, and then obviously um, aggregations also. So what's kind of interesting about this, 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 is, this is probably my favorite thing about, about case streams, um, is that case streams is, is a, what's termed a stateful stream processing engine. Um, and stateful stream processing engines are a little bit different um, because they don't just manage streams, they also manage tables. And this turns out to be really useful um, because uh, actually a lot of the things that we end up doing in business services is joining some stream of data with some thing that looks a lot like a table. Um, and databases alone are not particularly good at it. They're good at doing the tabular bit. They're not so, so good at doing the streaming thing, the streaming side. Um, and then typical stream processing, it's other stream processing engines, non-stateful ones, are quite good at doing the joining the streams, but not so good at joining the tables uh, uh, tables with a stream. And so what a table actually just means, all this really means is that um, we have infinite stream coming in here from Kafka into case streams, um, and we're going to join that to a table. And the, the main thing about a table is that it ha obviously has to have a key. It's backed by one of these compacted topics that we were talking about before. Um, but, and this, this, but this is actually entirely cached within the case streams engine itself. So this data um, is actually cached locally here. So this means we can do very, very fast lookups when we do joins between a stream um, and one of these, they're called k-tables. So th this is actually quite powerful. So particularly, so a, a good use case for this is just like a simple enrichment. So say we have like a stream of orders coming here into our, uh, into our service, and we want to join it with a set of customers. We can do that very, efficient, very efficiently if the customer's stream is compacted and lives inside Kafka, that will effectively, effectively just be cached locally, and that can overflow onto disk locally. Um, and then we can do this join very quickly and, and uh, easily enrich our data, our orders, with customer information. So this, this is actually really useful when it comes to, to um, efficiently tying together uh, different data sets um, within uh, a service that you're building. And obviously with case streams, as you might expect, Everything can be run distributed. Everything can be scaled out. Um, if you get a failure of one of these nodes, this one will take over. It'll even go so far to have, to have made sure that the data has been pre-cached up here so that the failure, failover is instantaneous and all that sort of stuff. So all that kind of stuff you can, you can basically take for granted. 
um, it will be sufficient for managing some very big streaming data pipeline. So that's quite nice. And the other thing is it's just embeddable, right? It's actually just effectively a jar. It's just a library which you install um, and you can operate in the JVM and you can integrate with your own application. And that's actually really cool. So you get all the power of this, of the ability to join tables, maintain intermediate state, and, and um, uh, join to locally cached tables all within um, this, this sort of one library. So that was case streams. Um, so we talked about Kafka, that kind of service backbone. Um, we talked about case streams, the ability to sort of declaratively operate on streams um, as we join them in our services. And then finally, the final part is, um, is Kafka Connect, um, which is really about view replication. So sometimes we just need to physically move data, or we need to physically materialize data. So that might, might be because we've got a legacy system and it's the only way to get data out of it, or it might be because we want to do polyglottic persistence um, and we want to store, get, our data, get some data set into maybe a relational database to, uh, so it can be used by some uh, proprietary querying tool and then also maybe Elasticsearch because we want to do some sort of free format queries, that kind of thing. So this is quite a useful pattern um, for basically when we actually have to move data. When we talk about these principles at the end, we see that there's a sort of there's an interplay between these two concepts. This idea of dealing with streaming data, which is very ephemeral, um, and this idea of actually physically moving data, which tends to be a little bit more sort of concrete. So, and the key thing here is really when we replicate data using Connect, we're creating multiple identical copies of that data. And actually making sure that they're identical over time is one of the keys, but we'll be talking about a little bit about, about that later. But then the other not quite nice thing is that we can actually iterate a bit when we do this. So because all this stuff's going through Kafka, um, and Kafka can retain state, that means that if anything goes wrong, we can either replay. But we can also do this thing where we actually regenerate views. And this is actually really important for um, basically being agile with data. It's actually really hard to be agile with data because data is kind of a big, heavy, weighty thing uh, that's kind of hard to, to manipulate or time-consuming to manipulate. Um, but one of the quite nice things about having um, something where you can basically just replay a data set into a database is it means you can kind of start with a small schema um, rather than sort of saying, right, I'm going to take this entire gigantic schema and import this data into my service so I can query it. Um, you can sort of say, well, we can, we'll just take this, this small subset. We'll take this few, these few fields, and then if we need to increase the coverage, we can do that incrementally over time. So that kind of idea of being incrementally evolving um, uh, uh, your coupling to a data set is actually pretty powerful, particularly, obviously, from a coupling perspective. So that's Kafka Connect. That's it. It's basically a bit like an ESB. It allows us to connect a whole ecosystem of databases to one another via Kafka, via and so it sort of gets actually gets some data, gets data in and out of your streaming platform. So basically, here we have um, we talked about three different components. We talked about Kafka, which provides this scalable, full tolerant, uh, strongly ordered, um, oops, uh, service backbone, um, something which you can effectively wrap your services around and you can rely on to be um, always on and effectively infinitely scalable. And then we talked about K-Streams, this embeddable tool for data manipulation, um, something which allows us to kind of easily adapt, aggregate streams, um, as well as sort of run continuous queries, continuous queries or enrich data by blending tables with streams. And then finally, we talked about Kafka Connect, our ability to basically replicate data sources. And those kind of three form the sort of the three pillars of, of the Confluent platform. So finally, I just wanted to talk about um, how do we actually do this, right? How do we do these things? So now here we have kind of 10 principles for, pre for, for, for streaming services, um, and they are inherently somewhat opinionated because they're my opinions. <laughs> At least they, they, they derive from my experience. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to run through them. 
So the first one is, don't use Kafka for shopping carts. Um, and what I really mean by that is that requesting, using a sort of durable broker technology to get the contents, you know, the contents of a shopping cart into a web browser um, would be, is, is somewhat overkill. So um, use a lightweight re re request response protocol when a lightweight request response protocol makes sense. Okay? Um, you can use Kafka for, for request response, but if you do, use it sparingly um, and try and pick the right tool for the job. And do, however, use Kafka for your core business processing. So this idea of creating business events, events which actually correlate to real things, real entities in, in, in the real world. You know, an order is created, someone asks for, an, uh, for something to be returned, you know, a payment was actually physically made. So th these concepts of, of coupling real business event, real business facts, will changes in state from the services, um, put those into Kafka and leverage the pub sub that comes from it. Number two, which is similar to that, I guess, is pick topics with business significance. So orders, payments, returns, invoices, things that actually mean something. And when you do, pick meaningful keys where they matter. And then version them in the log. So here we have like order service one, so we want to include the service name. Um, I'd always include the service name in the key because um, it gives us a lot of independence if we need to create other services as time goes on. Um, that's actually the one that most people tend to forget. Um, it should include the entity, the thing that it actually relates to in the real world, um, the key itself, in this case, one, two, three, four. And if this is, a, if, if this is a, a, a mutable piece of data, like an order would be, like an order can be amended over time, then make sure you give it a version. And then just write that to the look. So principle number three is decouple publishers from subscribers. Um, so this is a fairly obvious one, but um, if we're using a broker technology, it means that we can have things like this UI service publishing events then sourcing events to the log, and they have, has no reason, uh, there's no reason for it to be dependent, uh, for any other service to be effectively dependent on, uh, for it to be dependent, sorry, on any other service. So we can add services in here without ever having to change the UI service or ask it to redirect calls um, to different services. But do add request response where, where you need it. But don't, don't be afraid not to. So you, simulate, you can simulate that with Kafka to a certain degree, um, uh, but you can also um, use a, a different protocol if that works better. Um, number four, use the log to generate state, or so as to regenerate state. So avoid uh, journaling incoming events, just generate them to a database or whatever so that you can regenerate, rely on the fact that the log is there and if you need to go back and reprocess, um, you can. And then event source side effects. So inside a, inside a, a service itself, um, you're likely to go through a set of steps and some of those steps might well have side effects like you're making a payment to some external provider or whatever it might be. Um, so internally, you need to invent. You would need you would typically event source those so that you can basically map, get yourself back to the same state that you were in if, uh, when you when you failed, if, if you did crash. Um, and you can do that in a bunch of ways. You can use Kafka. You can use a history and state store. You can use another database. It's sort of entirely up to you. You just need to obviously in journal each of those uh, each of those side effects. Number five. Apply the single writer principle. So what this effectively means is when you have a set of services like this, um, if we want to change an order, we make sure that we always go back to the order service. Um, we, never, we never take a copy of the orders over here and then store them somewhere and mutate them there. So always change data at source and let the change propagate down. Um, that's actually uh, this, this one's actually really important because um, it's one of the most kind of fundamental patterns uh, that's very, very hard to add in in retrospects. It's really, once you've started, 
if you erode this pattern, it's really hard to get it back. So it's always worth, if, if, if we're starting this kind of service-based architecture, to ensure that when we do have to create cache copies, let's say down in this stock, this, this stock, this stock service, um, we have a database with a bunch of orders in, then we always want to make sure that when we actually make, if we have a need to make alterations to that order, for whatever reason, um, we go back to this service. So effectively that means that any local copy is, is always immutable. So number six, leverage keeping data sets inside the broker. And this is kind of a very stream processing thing to do, but um, we can actually leave data sets inside the broker itself. Um, and if we use these compacted topics, then it, it provides this sort of middle ground between what is effectively a stream and what is effectively a table. So this idea that data sets can just be available for any service to use directly from the broker. They're still, they're not actually fit, obviously fixed tables, they're totally streaming resources, they're, they're representative of streams. Um, but it's this idea that we can then share data in this way that sort of, it's not as, doesn't have the tight couplings of a traditional database, um, but has some of the persistence aspects that, that, that are actually useful in that regard. Um, and then uh, going, going along with that is, yeah, leverage keeping this latest version, this latest version view, um, that tabular view where you only keep, where you keep just the most recent copy. Um, and actually it's pretty useful to have both of those generally, to keep the version copy and the latest copy, the compacted or the regular one. And then join processes on the fly, right? So if you can, if you can solve a problem, um, by simply just joining, let's say, a stream with a, with a compacted stream, um, that can be a lot more efficient than, let's say, copying all the data into a database where you have to maintain that historic copy over time. Um, so that's generally a slightly easier thing to do. Which brings us to, to point number seven. Prefer stream processing over maintaining historic views. So, again, if this stock service um, wanted to import all these orders, so it might uh, take a copy of all of these orders into this, into a, a database, whatever it might be, Sandra or Elasticsearch or maybe even a relational database. Um, we always have the potential for these to diverge over time. Um, so there's a couple of solutions to this. One is actually just to like load them away and regenerate them, which is um, often possible if we're retaining data inside of the log. Um, but it all, but the, um, the ideal is actually just to avoid this completely and instead uh, to actually just, just to do our stream, just use a stream processing engine to just provide a streaming join for the, for the query that we need to do. And then we never need to write it down. The stream processing is always a kind of lighter weight solution in that regard. So it's definitely worth um, considering over the problem of like pulling together large amounts of data and storing them in a database to do, database to do retrospective an analysis. Yeah, so again, it's this idea of joining and processing data on the fly, joining orders with customers. So principle eight, nearly there. Um, so just completely contradicts the previous two points um, where we're sort of saying preferring stream processes processing, sometimes you just need historic views. You just do. You're doing a reporting use case. You need something that's retrospective. You need the analytic function that comes with, um, I don't know, Elasticsearch or something. So in this case, replicate data, but keep it read-only. Right? That's, that's kind of the key. So create um, completely immutable copies of data somewhere else, which you can use at your, at, at your will. So, first stream processing, but if you can't replicate, and if you do replicate, really, the key point here is, yeah, keep this guy read only, fix it source. And then use this, this incremental iterative approach to sort of grow your data coupling. So don't import everything if you don't have to. Pick the things that you need. Um, you can also use this pattern, as I mentioned earlier, for polygonic persistence using a bunch of different connectors. So that can be really useful if you want to use different types of database engine like a graph database or um, inverted index or 
uh, something that's a bit more scalable, etc. So number nine, use schemas, uh, especially if data is retained. Um, so this 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 isn't so much in your database. This is actually more with regard to um, category itself and moving data around. So it makes a lot of sense um, to put a schema around your data. Really, particularly if you're keeping it around because schemas data doesn't age well. So if you're doing using a stream processing engine, you often want to leverage history. Um, and schemaless data doesn't age particularly well because what you can end up with is a bunch of different versions of the same schema. Um, if you're Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an attendee in listen-only mode. Uh, which streams is actually a particularly good um, example uh, of this. I think I mentioned that, yes. So K-Streams is a great tool set for this. So, um, uh, yeah, in this example, we're just taking a stream. I'm doing a very, very simple transform to go from a version stream to a later stream. Um, that's actually literally just pulling data from one topic to another. But likewise, we might do something like implementing CQRS. Um, among query response segregation, where we take um, an input data set into the into write optimized store, um, use case streams to transform it into a read optimized view, and push it out uh, to queries that way. So there's a whole bunch. It's very easy to do transformations at case streams, very elegant in that regard. Um, so it's actually a really good use case for doing this, and it's literally built for pulling data out of one topic and putting it into another. So don't use category for shopping carts. Um, pick topics with business significance, uh, decouple publishers from subscribers, uh, use the log to regenerate state, um, apply the single writer principle, that's probably actually the most important of all of these, um, leverage keeping data sets inside the broker if that's useful to you, um, generally prefer stream processing over maintaining historic views if you can, because it means you don't have to maintain or have the weight of that, of that, of that, uh, that state over time. Um, but sometimes you do need these historic, historic views, so just make sure you always replicate or try to always replicate read only. It's actually quite hard to do in practice, but um, if you're not geared up for it. Um, use schemas and also consider stream management services. So microservices push us away from shared mutable state. 
in this kind of idea that you need to share data in a database, but state needs to be communicated anyway. Um, and in an increasingly data-heavy world, you need tools to do this efficiently um, and in real time. So we need this kind of data-centric tool set to do this. So back to buying things like legacy, legacy change data capture or new replication, polypodic persistence, all of these things that we've talked about, building them together into, into a, to a single service architecture that blends effectively data in flight uh, and uh, uh, effectively data persistence. So yeah, keep it simple, keep it moving. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Ben Stopford, and I, I went slightly longer than I had hoped. Um, we did start a little bit late. Um, but yes, has anyone got any questions? Let's have a look. Looks like we've got some there. Um, OK. Someone else. Yes, so anyone who's interested in, in, uh, in the slides and the recording will be provided uh, later. Um, so we have a question here from Derek Tyner saying, how can we effectively leverage an event-driven architecture and a message broker with a need for atomic transactions and awareness of whether something was processed successfully? That is a fantastic question um, because I totally didn't get a chance to talk about that and I would love to have talked about it. Um, so what, what Derek's actually asking here really is um, how do I get transactional guarantees around this kind of, this kind of service platform? And, and that's actually where you need um, exactly one's processing. You need some form of automatic idempotence or actually better is a transaction manager. And actually, that's exactly the sort of thing that a stream processing engine needs to get for it to get for it to guarantee repeatable results. Um, and that's actually why uh, we have this exactly once uh, work, which is which is ongoing. Um, so it's not finished yet, um, but it will be in the platform soon. And that's actually one of the interesting things we were talking about. Um, uh, we were talking about um, uh, stateful stream processing. One of the reasons it's so important to do joins inside the engine, um, so, join, so joining a, a, a stream and a table inside KStreams itself, is that it means that you're within this kind of this bounded context, which where you can actually provide transactional guarantees efficiently. Because it's actually reasonably easy to provide transactional guarantees. Um, there are a number of, sort of transaction managers that would do it, do that back to go dating back to the J2 EE days. It's actually pretty hard to get these things to work um, efficiently. So one of the nice things about keeping it all inside um, the Kafka ecosystem is that our exactly once processing engine will be able to deal with that very efficiently. Whereas as soon as you call out to an external database or you have a side effect, then it's, that's effectively kind of outside of the transactional boundary and you would lose any of those guarantees. So we can't offer that right now, but we'll be able to offer it really soon. Um, that was a great question. So there's quite a few here. Um, let me pick another one. Um, so it says, someone else there says asked, um, it appears to me that all consumer and producer services need to be upgraded at the same time, uh, which is usually not not feasible. I mean, any sizable deployment. Um, no, there shouldn't be any re any real reason for that. Um, you can uh, do a, actually you can do a rolling upgrade of your consumers uh, and your producers um, because uh, effectively um, you can run multiple instances of them and um, uh, as you take down one, its data will be, will be sent to another one. Um, likewise, you can actually do rolling, you can always do a rolling upgrade of Kafka itself um, and the same with consumers. So that, that, that shouldn't actually be a problem. Um, you should never actually need uh, to do a um, a single step change upgrade. Actually, the only time that you're, you're ever likely to fall into that problem is when you have a non-backwards compatible data change. Data change is actually so, so, so breaking the schematic compatibility um, is actually often a, a more, much more tricky problem to solve. Um, and actually, generally involves basically having windows in which you publish um, uh, the same information in two different forms. 
so that people don't have to change at once. Um, can the tables be cached in cached in Kafka topics? Is another question. Absolutely. The tables that we're talking about in Kafka streams are totally cached inside Kafka topics. And in fact, you can create your own tables locally and write those back to Kafka topics. So you get all the durability guarantees of Kafka, all of the fault tolerance in a table inside Kafka streams, which is actually pretty cool. Um, performance metrics we do have. Um, they somewhere. I have to come back to it now. Um, I know we did them. Um, five more minutes. Just going through a few more of these questions. Um, will Kafka ever have an actor mo model like abstraction where I could get request reply mechanism out of the box for a topic? Um, I don't know. I don't know of any plans of doing that. Um, I know why you'd ask that question. Um, but yes, I don't know of any plans to do that, that particular one. Um, Tim Hunt is asked, how do you get by the issue where a compacted topic may contain duplicate keys in between compaction? I'm not sure I totally understand that question. Uh, Tim, maybe you could update that one. Um, I'll come back to it. I have to read these questions. Um, so someone asked a question about SSL. Um, uh, do we store the data encrypted in SSL inside Kafka? The answer is no, we don't. Um, SSL or TLS is actually just providing provides encryption on the wire. So if you want it encrypted on disk, you need to add that encryption before you send your messages. Um, someone asked, is Kafka Connect work it, does Kafka Connect only work with relational databases? Absolutely not. It works with all sorts of different types of databases. In fact, that's one of the great use cases for it um, to use it for polyglotic persistence. So whatever, Elasticsearch, Cassandra. Uh, Mongo, we have connectors for all these different things in the connectors ecosystem. Um, someone else asked, is, Ka is Kafka Streams Java only? Yes, it is. Um, Someone asked, how can one simulate request response over Kafka? Um, really simply, you can just create two topics, one for commands and one for, for, for responses, um, and publish data down, there, down, down them. Um, but it's not a great pattern, because you're basically creating a directed channel, a channel between two services, um, and dedicating that channel effectively uh, to that, you know, dedicated to two, at least two topic partitions, that single, um, that single inter interconnect. Um, so, yeah, generally you end up questioning whether or not it's a sensible thing to do. But you can totally do it. There's no reason why you can't do it. Um, and actually, quite a lot of people do do it. But um, it's not something that's likely to scale particularly well. It becomes hard to manage um, because these things are persistent, right? So, if you can use um, if you do request response, like if you're just like updating that, that your, your shopping basket, something that's completely transitory and has no business significance whatsoever, like the browser wants to know, you know, what's in the shopping basket, then it just makes more sense to use a technology, a lightweight technology that's good at doing request response rather than something which is actually effectively more like a database. Um, okay, so um, thank you Ben for that thank you Ben for answering all those questions um, thank you all for joining us today there was quite a few questions that we didn't get around to answering but um, we definitely have them recorded and we'll try our best to reach out to you individually to get those answered um, and again thank you for joining us um, this session was recorded um, and we will email the video recording to all of you and the slides will be provided as well. Um, if you guys have any other questions, please contact us at um, confluent.io slash contact or we're
on Twitter at Confluent Inc. Um, and we are happy to help you in any way we can. Um, thank you again, Ben, for that great um, presentation. And thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Bye. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye.